glorious death of all English counties, perhaps the best famed for the variety and beauty of its scenery. Every year, thousands of people make their way to the sandy beaches and green lanes of Devon, escaping from the towns and suburbs and from the factories and the shops to holiday in this pleasant and welcoming county. Some prefer the sands and more popular pleasures. Others seek the austere beauty of Dartmoor with its vastness and solitude. These hikers seem to be making their way across the moor in the direction of Tavistock, there perhaps to see the ruins of the old abbey and dream back over nearly eight centuries to the original Benedictine settlement. In those days, much of the land was the property of the church and here, quite close to Tavistock, the abbot had his country seat at Morwell. He found the River Tamar provided excellent fishing and the land was good for farming. Records exist to this day giving details of what this land was earning in the 15th century. In 1497, when wool was about one and fourpence of fleece and wheat 12 shillings a quarter, pasturage brought in an annual two pounds eight and tenpence and corn crops another five pounds seven and six. The Barton House was rebuilt in the late 15th century. And it still remains to this day, little altered in outward appearance. There's a vast difference, however, in what this land now produces. Last year, 66,000 gallons of milk was sold for well over 10,000 pounds. Mr. Archer Neve now farms Morwell, and since he first took over the tenancy in 1949, he's made a great many changes. To anyone who thinks of Devon only for its holiday pleasures, this will be an object lesson in hard work and enterprise. Coming from the drier climate of Essex, Archer Neve found a very different set of conditions in this rainy area. Standing over 400 feet above sea level, the land gets about 53 inches of rain a year. The weather is liable to change quickly and a flexible system of farming is needed. After a short period of mixed farming, Mr. Neve realized that the true value of the land lay in its pastures and not in its corn crops. The wet climate meant corn was out and grass was in. In place of mixed farming, a streamlined system for milk production has been established. To feed his pedigree Ayrshire herd of 89 cows and 83 followers, Mr. Neve relies on a simple grass and kale rotation, with some rape and perhaps winter rye as a catch crop. Above all, he's concentrated on the development of good grassland. This shows the layout of the 200-acre farm. It's in fairly hilly country, about five miles southwest of Dartmoor, and it's completely surrounded by woods. The farm stands on a plateau and is free draining, and practically all the fields have a southerly aspect. It looks quite a picture, but some years ago, when Mr. Neve first came to Morwell, the ingoing payable amounted to no more than eight and sixpence per acre. The farm buildings were rather out of date. Now the shippen has been converted into calf pens, a yard and parlour system has been introduced, and the yards concreted. An electricity supply has been installed. 
The west wing has been converted into two modern cottages and all the buildings lie compactly in a single block of land served by well-kept roads. Gateways have been repaired and widened to 11 feet. The soil is a medium loam on a slate and quartz clay. Soil analyses taken in 1949 showed that all fields were low in phosphates, potash and lime. This has now been corrected and the fields receive two and a half to three hundred weights of complete fertilizer each spring plus additional dressings of nitrogen. Archer Neve believes in getting things done and makes the maximum use of available labor. He's helped by his son John, who recently finished his national service, two full-time men and a boy. The changeable climate makes it very necessary to get a move on when conditions are right. Let's start Mr. Neve's farming year in late February, when the cows are well into his last field of kale. The kale and some rape have been grazed throughout the winter, and by using a kale and grass rotation, Mr. Neve simplifies his farming. While there is still three to four weeks kale for the cows, he makes his preparations for early grass. This second year lay of H1 ryegrass is to provide the early bite this year, and it therefore receives a dressing of nitro chalk at 400 weights per acre. The cows are still enjoying the kale, and it's certainly good stuff. All fields are supplied with water, about three quarters of this being done with buried alkathene tubing, although here a portable tank brings water nearer to the grazing face and avoids excess poaching in any one place. Winter grazing is supplemented with silage, which is cut and carried to the fields. The pit is nearly empty now, the end of some 300 tons of winter feed. Spring grass should be ready in another couple of weeks. While the cows are in for evening milking, silage is distributed in one of the fields close to the kale. Here, in fact, the back area of the kale field is being used, although more usually it's fed in a grass field, which is soon to fall due for ploughing. As a rule, silage is fed behind an electric fence. This prevents it from being trampled and wasted while the field gets an even natural manuring in readiness for the next crop. Before the kale is quite finished, the early grass is ready, and in early April, the weather permits the first strip graze of the season. The dressing of nitrogen we saw being applied has meant an early full crop of high quality grass. Further grazings and two silage cuts will be taken from it during the year. With the changeover to grass, the kale fields are ploughed and seed beds are prepared for new lays. After the usual preparations, CCF is applied at 300 weights per acre and harrowed in. When the seed bed is ready, a short-term ryegrass and clover mixture is sown at 28 pounds an acre. This is to be a three-year lay, providing mid-season grazing this year and early and late grazing in subsequent years. Much importance is placed on rolling thoroughly to give good consolidation. Keeping to the rotation, last year's rape fields are now to be ploughed and sown to kale. To start with, they get a good dressing of farmyard manure of about 20 tonnes to the acre.
This is then ploughed in with the stubble. By early May, the new lays are showing well all over the farm. Beyond this reseed, cows are grazing a second year lay. The early grass is finished, but there is now plenty of other grazing to follow on. The acreage of temporary grass has been more than trebled since 1949, and at the moment there are only 36 acres of permanent pasture. This includes about 18 acres of land which is unploughable due to steepness or rocky outcrop. To keep 174 animals, plenty of food must be grown. So to be on the safe side, Mr. Neve grows winter feed slightly in excess of his requirement. Any surplus, such as this rape, is dissed in. This field is now ploughed, and after getting 400 weights of CCF to the acre, it will be drilled with kale. The marrow stem kale is sown at three pounds per acre. Invariably, this seed has been dressed to give protection against flea beetle, wireworm, and fungal disease. This field, which we saw being ploughed in April, is also being sown to kale. Mr. Neve works quickly, and here, in fact, he started drilling before the fertiliser distributor has finished in the field. Now, as before, good consolidation is important. Another field for kale. This year, three fields in all are being sown. This green crop plays a vital part in the farm's economy, and 30 to 40 acres are grown every year. The grass which we saw being sown at the end of April is now showing through, but at the moment it's not making much headway. This year the country is having an extremely dry spring, and Devon is no exception. Grass growth is not enough to support strip grazing, and so the stock are allowed to range. Archer Neve has good cause for concern. The land is crying out for rain. The drought is seriously menacing the reseeds and later grazing, and in many places the ground is cracked and dry. Such weather is a severe test of milk production, but even under these conditions, maintenance and four gallons are produced from grass. The weather didn't break until June the 3rd, when the heavens opened and well over half the month's rain fell in 24 hours. From then on, sunny days were the exception, and Devon was in for a damp and dreary summer. And so were the holiday makers. From a cow's point of view, you get no holiday anyway, and a drop of rain was just what we needed, so back to strip grazing. In this climate, haymaking is a risky business, so Mr. Neve has concentrated on silage making. The first silage cut is in the H1 ryegrass field, which provided our early bite. Rather than wait for ideal weather conditions, 
he cuts his grass when it reaches the right stage of growth. This year, as you've seen, due to the spring drought, the top grew rather heady before there was enough bottom growth to provide a cut. Once started, four fields are cleared in the shortest possible time. Mr. Neve uses only a small team, but they work hard and they work fast. With his three paid helpers, he's been known to make nearly 400 tons of silage in about 16 days. After the first few loads, a thermometer is used to check the initial heating up. Then the pit is rolled. Cutting continues as load by load the pit is filled and compacted. Due to the drought, other lays which have so far carried the cows are not yet ready for cutting. So further grass is being supplied by the permanent pastures which haven't been grazed. These are always a good standby. This is all the grass available for silage at the moment, so Mr. Neve decides to seal off this first half of the pit with a layer of ground limestone to protect it from the weather. It'll be another month before there's enough grass to fill the second half. The lime requirement of the land is also carefully watched and ground limestone applied where necessary, as in this field, which has just been cut for silage. All lays which have been cut are dressed with CCF at 300 weights to the acre. In early June, this new lay, which was sown in April, is first of all range grazed. This is done for a short period by large numbers of stock, a way of further consolidating new grass to obtain good establishment. When all the reseeds have been grazed over, they get a further 200 weights of nitro chalk to the acre. It is also given to other lays after each cut or graze. The silage pit is still only half full, but now by late July enough grass is ready to complete the job. We saw this field being cut six weeks ago. Bear in mind it's given up to now the first graze of the year and two silage cuts. In fact, before the year is out, it will have given eight separate crops of grass the valuable result of good management. Silage will now be cut from the older lays, such as this third year lay, which has had heavy applications of nitrogen balanced with phosphates and potash, and there's certainly plenty of clover here. When full, the pit will be completely sealed with limestone and covered with corrugated metal sheeting, which cost Mr. Neve about £110, money well spent to keep his silage dry. It contains 36% dry matter with a 14% protein content. Let's go back and look at the kale which was sown a month ago. In late June it was being hoed, and now, in late July, it can be seen growing away well. Preparations are made in early August for the catch crops, rape and winter rye with ryegrass, which is being tried this year for the first time. Older lays, still in good fettle, are ploughed up in readiness for the seed bed. Together with kale, these will take care of winter feed. Now, how are the cows faring? Well, by late July, the reseeds already range grazed are in full production and being strip grazed.
After grazing, the field is topped over to level up the sward and to encourage even growth. This is followed by a dressing of basic slag. Mr. Neve prefers low-grade Albion slag as it also provides trace elements and each field gets a dressing once every three to four years. This year, some 70 tons have been used. In early September, nitro chalk at 300 weights per acre is applied to certain selected fields to extend their use for late grazing. Meanwhile, Archer Neve likes to keep his fields tidy, and when his men have any time to spare, he keeps them busy hedging and doing other maintenance jobs around the farm. By the end of September, grass which is ready has to be ranged as the ground has become too wet for strip grazing. As soon as conditions improved, the fence was used again and grazing continued until late October. Now, with the onset of winter, the 89 dairy cows have started on the first field of kale. There are two fields of marrow stemmed for feeding now, and another of thousand headed, which will winter better and be used later on. The silage pit has been opened, and the cows are back again on their winter diet. So far, we've dealt only with the provision of food for the herd. We've seen how grass and kale are grown on this farm. Now, what about the way these crops are turned into milk and then into cash? The dairy herd must be well managed to make the most of the work and the money which have been put into the land. Archer Neve is proud of his T.T. Morwell herd, which he's built up to more than twice the number of animals carried on the farm just after the war. At the moment, it consists of 89 pedigree Ayrshire cows, two bulls, and young stock. Many of the cows have been bred from the noted Bargower herd. The parlour accommodates six cows, five being milked at a time. In the interests of hygiene, udder wash is used, and the parlour and plant kept sterile with chloros. The 83 cows in milk can be dealt with here in about one and three quarter hours. A new electronic pulsator has been installed which has shortened milking times considerably. It can be seen that these old buildings have been completely modernized inside and fitted with up-to-date equipment. The milk, after recording, is drawn through into the dairy, running through a completely sealed circuit from cow to churn. In the dairy, a vacuum cooler unit fills four churns at a time, and here, as in the parlor, the strictest hygiene is observed. Washing up utensils in dairy detergent ensures their complete cleanliness. The herd has a very good milking record. In the year ending September 1956, the cows averaged 901 gallons, with a calving index of 378 days. The heifers averaged 703 gallons. These are reasonable yields, with concentrates fed at a yearly average of only two pounds per gallon but high yields are not the chief objective. Archer Neve believes that more profit can be made by stepping up milk production from grass and reducing the feeding of concentrates. He plans to feed nothing but grass in the summer 
and to ration concentrates efficiently in winter. At the same time, the quality of his milk is fully maintained, as shown by the butterfat content of 3.92%. The calving index shows that there have been no difficulties in getting the cows in calf. During the winter period, then, the cow's maintenance and two gallons of milk are obtained from kale and silage. Four pounds of concentrates are fed for every gallon above this. Generally, no concentrates are fed during the grazing season, but cows whose previous lactation and rest period justify it get four pounds of concentrates for each gallon after the fourth. The herd is predominantly autumn calving. Heifer calves, which are to be reared, are bucket-fed for 35 days. During this time, dry feed is introduced, when they're about six days old, to encourage rumination before milk feeding is stopped. That's the first and last time this calf will suckle its mother. The advantages of dehorning are well recognized, and Mr. Neve endeavors to do this when the calves are two to three weeks old. At least 10 days before they go out to grass, they're vaccinated against blackleg. They're then between five and nine months old. On a fine day, the calves are allowed out to graze for the first time, and they just can't wait to get on that grass. The fact that this paddock is the old burial ground of the monks doesn't seem to worry these youngsters, but it deters Mr. Neve from ploughing it up. Note the roomy bodies of these calves. Before coming to grass, they've had plenty of hay and silage to develop their capacity for bulky food. This same feature is seen later on in the dairy cattle. Mr. Neve is always closely concerned with the health of his animals. Careful attention is paid to the purity of their water supply and the cleanliness of troughs. For the first two years of the tenancy, a lot of trouble was caused by red water, but this has been overcome by ploughing and liming the old pastures. Small shelters containing mineral supplement are to be found in every field. The health of the herd is reflected in the quantity and the quality of the milk. Every year TT tests are made and since the herd was formed in 1949 there have been no reactors. Here then at Morwell Barton we have good grassland management coupled with good cowmanship. Using enough fertilizer, especially nitrogen, gives high quality grass, providing good grazing and heavy cuts for silage. It gives a long grazing season on which a quick turnaround is possible. Stock numbers can therefore be high. The herd is a hardy one, and thanks to outwintering, the amount of cover required is small. As no corn is grown, all straw must be bought in, but due to outwintering, as little as possible is used, and by buying carefully, straw costs are kept to a minimum. Mr. Neve believes in simplicity and efficiency. He believes in getting things done, but he practices economy of effort. With his straightforward rotation system, compact labor force, and the overall tidiness of his farm management, he's able to make a very reasonable profit from his land.
It is land which, through the centuries, must have known many masters. If it owes its origins to the abbots of Tavistock, today it certainly owes its prosperity to Mr. Neave and his farming system, and there's no need for any of those old monks to turn in their graves. Thank you.